Postcards from a Dying World, the podcast. For more than a decade, I've reviewed over 1,000 books that are mostly science fiction, horror, and bizarro. This feed will feature bonus audio I have produced over the years, as well as a monthly digest of reviews based on what I've read each month, plus the occasional bonus material about my own fiction. Thanks for listening. Hello and welcome to Postcards from a Dying World. I am very excited to have my guest here for the first time. Uh, Sarah Pimbro is in the rare breed of author that I will read anything she writes, no matter what it is. There are only a few of those authors. It doesn't matter, genre, whatever. I'm reading it. And uh, there's a few that I have saved that from back in the day her early work that i you know i'm going to read eventually but when a new one comes out i'm there you probably best know sarah pinborough from her wildly successful both novel and tv series behind her eyes um and you know that's what you're probably most famous for sarah but for me the books that i got introduced to you through was through an article in rue morgue and I read the Dog Face Gods trilogy because it said they called it a darker repairman Jack. And I was on a repairman Jack kick that year where I tried to read all of the secret history in one year, which is quite a daunting thing. How many is that? Well, at the time it was 2012. So it was probably over 30. Now he's now Paul's added a few <laughs> here and there. And, and by the way, Paul is my plotting Yoda and you got to work with him on a book and I didn't even have a question on that, but I just want to say how jealous I am of you for that. <laughs> but the Dog Face Gods books are what was my introduction to Sarah Pimborough and basically everything you've released since then, I'm there, I'm there for it. Most recently, it's kind of starting with Behind Your Eyes, you kind of had a, a career change and we'll talk about that where the focus of your books kind of changed um but let's let's give people a baseline where did your love of genre and writing come from and i and i think i know this answer but i'm definitely interested to hear more details on how did you get into writing um i think like most people who do this for a job because as we all know sometimes we get lucky and make a lot of money but invariably the most, you know, we're not in it to get rich sadly right <laughs> Um, I just always did tell stories right from a kid. You know, it was always in there. It was always going to be acting or writing. And I always had that darkness stuff, you know, the fear. I mean, even so last week, we, you were just asking me how my holiday was. So I was in this big chateau in France with a bunch of friends and their kids. And my room, because it was sort of for my 50th birthday, so my room was the best room and it had a four poster bed, it was big. But this is a creepy old chateau. And there were kids who were just running up to bed like on their own. Like a 10 year old would go, oh, I'm just gonna go to bed. And they were going up to the third floor on their own. One night I was like, oh, I'm quite tired. I think I wanna go to bed. But I was really scared to go to bed in that room on my own because I thought <laughs> there might be something under the bed. So I was looking under the bed because I was thinking a hand's gonna come out get me and so as a child those things were a hundredfold so I was always drawn to that kind of the darker stories and then at boarding school I read a lot of um Pam Book of Horror you know the short stories all the mm. horror stories and then of course there was James Herbert and then there was Stephen King and Daphne du Maurier and Roald Dahl so I always was drawn to the dark the dark side um and then actually weirdly I started mucking around with short stories I wrote one when I was in early 20s and I sent it off somewhere, some awful, awful little small press thing that was very pretentious. And they wrote back, uh, they're out of business now. They wrote back and said that um, I wasn't a writer. It was a terrible story. I should never write another story. But then I was watching The Sandman this week, which I loved. And I remembered actually that when I was about 27, I had another dabble at a short story and it was called Morpheus and Morphine. And it was kind of, I used those characters from the Sandman graphic novel. So it was, you know, I start, I kind of always kept going. And then as with everybody finally wrote a book, you know? Yeah. Right. Did you have a light bulb story that communicated with you? Like I always talk about the raft by Stephen King was 
for me. And I found, in do, and when I mention it, a lot of other writers are like, oh yeah, me too. That one was a big one. But like, did you have any stories or novels where like that was the one where I, I, I decoded what it meant to be a writer or storyteller? I don't know. I mean, when I was reading Stephen King when I was young, I was just reading them for the sheer love of it. And I, But I do think he... I think opened a door in a lot of us from that generation, you know, that I think even just enjoying those stories, your brain was like, oh my God, there's character that it wasn't just about the horror. It wasn't, you know, they're not at like the talisman for me, the the raft as well, mm-hmm. I think. And the mist I loved long walk was a big one for me. I loved the long walk. Oh, you have great um, taste in Stephen King. I can tell. <laughs> like a lot of those oh, and the talisman one, I think, the dead zone was a big one for me. Yeah, too. yeah, yeah. So I think all, I mean, I used to get them on Christmas Day, get the hardback, and they would be done by Boxing Day. You know, I would just sit there and read through. So I, I don't know if I had we'll, a book. We'll, we'll come back to Stephen King because I think he's an part, interesting part of the recent story. Yeah, of, you know, yeah. yeah. Um, I've got a picture of him, me and Stephen King up on my wall. I, yeah, <laughs> I would do that too if I had that. <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't know if there was a moment that unlocked it. I mean, in many ways, I mean, I still love reading, but I I wish I could separate the reading from the work. I think I enjoyed reading more before I was published, if you know what I mean. And I think also, weirdly, before I was, I hate using saying successful because it sounds so arrogant, but the more successful I've become, the more books I get sent to proofread, to, you know, give blurbs for, which means... Right they're all thrillers it's always the same kind of book it's all you know and even though some of them are really great books I get really bored of reading woman in peril you know like kind of is it my husband is it if someone stole my baby you know these kind of books so my reading is (laughs) right (laughs) I think I'm gonna maybe put a kibosh on on reading advanced copies of something like I'm writing so I can get back into reading for fun yeah if that makes yeah, sense. Brian Brian Evanson recently did that where he was like because he's a he teaches mm. creative fiction too, so like he has to read a lot for school, and he just was like, plus I don't think people can pigeonhole it very easily. So, but also it just makes it work instead of yeah. reading for fun, it's reading for work. You know, like I found yeah. there's a woman I can't remember her name now, which is a terrible thing to say, but she's written a few books that I really enjoyed, and I found myself on a panel with her few years ago and last night I was listening to a podcast and they said oh she has a new book out and I was like oh and it's nothing you know it's already out it's it doesn't I can read it just for fun so I've ordered that I'm gonna read that that's about witches well that's great yeah well no and I understand too because um you know just as somebody who has been reviewing books for years like it's very different when somebody sends you a book rather than you just make a choice it's like because then you feel compelled to finish it and it's a whole it's a whole thing and you know people don't understand now, how sometimes that can take the joy out of it but well what i do now my new policy with it as well is i think a lot of the time people are sending the books because they want to give it some visual presence less about your blurb so now if someone sends me a proof regardless of whether i think i'm going to get to read it or whether i'm not reading anything at the time i will try and take a picture of it put it on Twitter and be like, oh my gosh, I've got this new book to read. It looks great. So at least it's getting some visual momentum because so few books get any marketing, you know, that I think, well, even if I'm not, even if I'm not going to get around to reading it for months, at least I've given it a little, you know, a thank you for sending me the proof kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Well, and, you know, there's certain authors who just, you know, they put, they, they just say they're interested and people automatically go, ding, you know, I mean, we've seen that. Stephen King effect, which we'll come back to. But um, so in the early years of your career, you you wrote a lot of um, horror novels with leisure and 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 did the and and did that whole thing. <laughs> that and whole thing. There was that, a little gang of us. There was Brian Keane, Tim Levin, Michael Lamo, James yeah. Moore. Well, Luke. and well, well, leisure has like kind of a pulpy tradition or whatever there's a lot of really good novels that came out of that whole thing and um i know recently i had tim on and he talked about how you know the nature of balance which was one of his leisure books like was a big turning point for him Mm. you know that even though like 
it wasn't as successful as some of his later books, he felt like it was a really important part of the process of learning to become a professional writer. And if he didn't mm. have those those early books, you know. Yeah, he, totally, totally. Yeah. So tell us about some of the, is there one from the leisure years that you feel particularly fond of or well, one that you would- You see, of? I really liked The Taken. And that mm. definitely was the one that got me, it was up for the best novel at the British Fantasy Awards. And, and that year I had, I was quite fed up. It was, I think, was it The Taken? It must have been The Taken, yeah. And I still owed Leisure a book or two, but um, I was getting really fed up with writing very straightforward horror. You know, this very, it has to fit in their guidelines. It has to do this, it has to do that. And I I wanted to write what became the Dogface Gods trilogy. You know, I wanted to, I had this idea for a retelling of Paradise Lost and something a little bit genre blending rather than sort of pulpy horror. And when The Taken was up for best novel, Joe Fletcher was at Galance at the time and she spoke to Steve Jones, the anthology editor, and said, oh, Sarah's been up for this award a couple of times. Is she just interested in horror? And he said, no, she wants to spread a little bit and do different things. So she then said, let's do lunch. And that was how I got. So actually The Taken, if The Taken hadn't been up for best novel, I probably yeah. it would have been a maybe a longer journey, but 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 weirdly, Breeding Ground, my women birthing spiders novel from Leisure, is often cited by people as their favorite of my works, which I, I'm not quite sure where to go with that. <laughs> right, <laughs> language of dying with death house behind her eyes, and it's the giant spiders that are that right. are making people smile. But yeah, that one's it. But you know, people liked it. I think they were a great learning curve for me, and I had that thing of. They weren't out in England, so I didn't get any kind of writer's ego over them because I never saw them anywhere. Whereas these days, I think for new new writers with social media and everything, it's a it's very easy to get sucked into believing your own hype or think you know, like getting jealous of other writers and stuff, which we didn't yeah. have starting out. You just have, you know you were kind of on your own, which in some ways was better, in some ways worse. Well, and I think that that's one thing that's been always cool about the horror community is everyone really likes each other and is really supportive of each other, and you know. Um, my theory on that, my theory on that is having now spent time in crime communities and others is that there's so few careers in horror, like yeah. solid working, you know, no other job careers because horror is still, people are still, even though it's having such a boom on television and it's slowly, you know, getting more in literature, people automatically say, I don't read horror. Yeah. You know, they might read Stephen King, but they don't read horror. You know, they, they view it as kind of gutter fiction. Mm -hmm. So we're all in it because we love it. You know, yeah. like it's not, we're not in it with the big bucks. Whereas you go to a crime convention and so many household names and so many careers and so, you know, there's a lot more to vie for. Whereas I kind of feel in horror, we, we've got to look out for each other because. Well, and when you know, you, like, right. And when you have a success like Behind Her Eyes, everyone was so stoked for you. There was no. That was what I love. People were so nice about it. There was no one was horrible. Everyone was so nice about it. It was so cool. Yeah, well, and I had an experience with long before it was a TV series, I was getting all the women at my work because I'm a teacher and I work with kids with autism and I was getting all the women at work to read behind her eyes. Right. Like and I and it started spreading. Um, and then at one point, one of my coworkers, she said to me, she was like, why are you working so hard to promote this woman's book? <laughs> and I was like, well, and I was like, well, you liked it, didn't you? And she was like, yeah, but like you put a lot of energy into telling people about this book. And I said, well, here, the thing was, is I knew it would work with you guys. I would promote all my friends' books with that kind of energy, but I knew you were all going to enjoy this one. So thank you. I, I had to think, well, plus you came to San Diego and signed at Mysterious Galaxies. And so that puts an extra bug in your, you know, when you meet the author and you get, you know, and that whole thing. But I was already a huge fan, so that that's besides the point. We'll get, and I kind of jumped a little bit, but when you took the step, like I'm going to be a novelist, I'm going to do this, like yeah, you know, like do you what was it, did you did you were you were you able to sell that first book to Leisure, or did you have a couple trunk novels before you got there? Um, I did write a book ages. I wrote a book before that actually, and it was kind of. And I totally forgot about it. And I've always said, oh, yeah, The Hidden was my first book. And then I thought, actually, 
like a couple of years before I wrote a novel which was very funny it was a funny book it was a murder story but it was very funny about these four women who bury this man in the back garden um so that was my first kind of that was my one book that went in the drawer you know that just kind of I don't even know where it is now do you have a really silly one from when you were a teenager because oh yeah yeah but I didn't finish it that was I got about 40 pages I think and it was like it was like a piss take not a piss take a rip off of um Logan's run it was that's that's awesome well you know Jeremy Robert Johnson and I have joked a a long time for, for years about how we would love to do an anthology of established writers early teenage terrible stuff unedited well a friend of mine found and i was quite proud of it actually she found some pages from when i was i must have been about 13 i wrote the school play and <laughs> right. yeah and i and she found some of these pages and it was like this kind of very funny robbery set and you know it was very yeah, it was a very funny kind of Agatha Christie style thing. And she found these pages and photocopied them and sent them to me. I was like, oh, my God. I do, you know, like, but I was kind of like, it goes to show it's, it's just in you, isn't it? It's just, you know, so it's our starting places. Mm-hmm. So and the Dog Face Gods trilogy is where you wanted to kind of spread your wings. And mm-hmm. to me, those books are so underrated and i know they were published in america as the forgotten gods i still think of them dog face gods because i bought them before ace picked them up and um i first like i said i first read about them in room org and like they they kind of call them like i think the thing that hooked me was that like it's almost like a darker repairman jack yeah which i don't think is the best description for it now that i've read them but the it's it's interesting because those books have one of the best and it's not even a huge major part of it, but it has like one of the creepiest serial killers um, with the, um, who's a man of flies. It's been many years since I read it, but yeah, but those books um, and that trilogy, uh, I like my friend, even Zorik who in Portland, like I made him a lifelong Sarah Pimborough fan by immediately. I'm going to say you royalties. <laughs> yeah. Well, for him, it was, I passed him a matter of blood. And I said, try not reading this whole trilogy after you read this is what I had told him. And then when I got the book back, he was like, he's like, yeah, I've already ordered the, the next two. And, and those books to me were what hooked me because I saw so much invention and there's a what i should say about those books there's a dystopic feel to it but there's also police procedural there's uh an an incredible vibe there um with those books and i just always have a matter of blood as an introduction on my top 10 horror novels lists all the time because even though you have to read the whole trilogy, I think that book does such an incredible job setting the mood. Can you tell me about writing those books and how important they were to your career? Oh, massively. Um, and and I owe, there's a writer called Mark Chadbourne who was a fantasy writer in England. And now he does, um, he's written, I think he wrote The Last Wilbur Smith. He's got a deal for a couple of the Wilbur Smith books. He wrote The Last mm-hmm. Kingdom, I think that just came out, The Lost Kingdom. Um, but he was with Galantz already. So he was a few years ahead of me and he he's very uh, business-minded, which I quite like, you know, because I'm quite business-minded. And when I had this lunch with Joe Fletcher after this discussion with the take and being up for the award, so what he said to me, if you're going for lunch with Joe, she is not just taking you for lunch for no reason, have something to pitch. So I had this kind of little rough idea and I knew I wanted to do paradise lost modernized i wanted to do i'd been reading john Connolly, and i'd realized that you really can mix some genre in with a crime novel and you know people will buy it so i was going to pitch it as one book and mark chadbron said to me why have a one book deal when you could have a three book deal (laughs) so maybe try and make it a trilogy so i was like "Uh uh-huh so i pitched this trilogy and they bought it which was great um so I was I was writing it and they also then bought which for me is I think maybe my favorite trilogy and 
even less people have read it than the dog face gods which was my nowhere chronicles uh, uh fairy tales the... or no 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 the nowhere chronicles was double edged sword uh the London Stone was the third. The Double Edged Sword, the Lon- Traitor's Gate, and the London Stone, and they were like teen fantasy, very kind of inspired by, I guess, Neverwhere style, but very dark. You know, um, I have not read those, so which is uh, cool. They're my I favorite story, my favorite story I've ever written. That's awesome. Um, but I was so I was writing one of so I wrote the Dogface Gods, then I wrote the first Nowhere Chronicles, then I wrote the second Dog <laughs> Dogface Gods. But so what it did was instead of kind of being able to edit to suit what came later, I would get myself stuck in a corner. So I, because the first book was already out when I was writing the third book. So mm. what it made for was much cleverer storytelling because I couldn't just go back and change something to mm. suit the third book. But I, I mean, like I have real, I don't have issues with religion, but I do find the whole subject matter of it fascinating. I mean, I'm not a religious person, but I do find different religions fascinating. So I wanted to play around with that. And I kind of, it was massive for me in that, yeah, they didn't make me a millionaire. And, you know, like trilogies are hard. If the first one doesn't hit, obviously the second one sells less and the third one sells even less. But it was a a good piece of work and people did sort of think like, oh yeah, she can tell a story, hopefully. So, well, you know, and it's yeah. actually still one that so many people say, oh, I love the dog face gods. I love the dog face gods. So the people who read it seem to really like it. So I was oh, absolutely. That. Absolutely. And I've, I've got, I mean, it was optioned for about 10 years and now I think someone else is going to option it. So that's quite good. Oh, and I hope there's a second life for it because mm-hmm. it, it's truly fantastic. Um, and then you did some interesting things. You did the, the fairy tale novels and um, which, which are really uh, obviously stretching different you know wings too yeah. like and then you know the two jack the ripper books too which are really interesting but let's talk about the fairy tale ones first like what was it like getting into like you know kind of modernizing that that it must was have been very really strange because it came about so i had actually it was quite interesting because i had left galance to go with joe fletcher books to write Murder and Mayhem, the, the Victorian ones. Um, and Gillian Redfern was still at Glance. We were still friends. And um, we were both watching Once Upon a Time, the first series, and we were both loving it. And she then texted me one day and said, how would you feel about writing some fairy tale novellas, some retellings? And I was like, yeah, I'm not sure I've kind of got those chops in me. You know, I'm not sure that's my kind of thing. And she said, well, have a think about it. Have a think about it. So I was reading fairy tales and I was like, well, if I was going to do them, I'd want to do really well-known ones so people can see what you're playing with. You know, like people know the pieces on the board when you move them around, it's more fun. So uh, I think Poison, so that was Snow White was the first one. And I was mulling and I thought, how am I going to tell this in a different way? What can I do that's fun? And I, I already decided I wanted to keep the kind of fairy tale language because I think that's quite fun. Um, and then I thought, what kind of man falls in love with a virtually dead woman in a box? You know, like right. who, who does that? Like, and properly falls in love with someone who's literally dead and trapped and in a box. And I thought, and this guy's supposed to be your hero. You know, like, how does that work? So I thought, well, I'm going to approach it all from this angle. So, and then they became interlinked. And I, what I loved about them was, and I, I'm, I again, I'm quite proud of the, I'm quite proud of these. And I got to have some fun, you know. There's some quite funny. I mean, they're dark and they're very sexy, but there's some really funny moments in them. I think, which I don't get to do very often. And I'm actually quite humorous. You know, I like funny things. I like to be funny. Um, so very I funny really, person. <laughs> I really enjoyed writing them. And people have asked me if I'd do some more, but I'm kind of nervous of breaking it I think it's quite nice you have this trilogy that works as a circle you know what the the end of beauty is the start of poison so it's like a proper never-ending story you kind of can go round and round um yeah so they were great fun and that actually kind of by that point mayhem had come out 
and it's an they've done a really combination too, yeah. right? I had for like that year, I had Mayhem come out, I had the three fairy tales, and I had the language of dying coming out. Like, not from PS, I had the mainstream version from Quercus. So I had like five books, it was ridiculous, too many books. But um, Joe Fletcher books had done a really bad job of marketing murder and mayhem because it just wasn't in any stores they didn't have any presence um so when Gillian said do you want to come and write a couple of YA novels I was like yes I think I will so then I did the death house and 13 minutes back with Galance but yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah and I was gonna ask about those two next um it, but it's funny because uh murder and mayhem like that it, it's funny for the lack of output that there was for the marketing the amount of work that you have to do to write historical novels speaking to somebody who who just finished a historical yeah i mean it's like people say do a thousand words a day and you're like yeah that's easy to say when you haven't spent two hours trying to find out what someone would have for dinner you know like it's just like but the funny thing with that one was when they came out um there was a review in the paper and it said oh, she's really got the Victorian style right. She's really got the flavor of it, apart from the news articles. They said all the news articles, they don't read like proper newspaper articles. And I had to email them and go, those are all real newspaper articles. (laughs) They were all from the time. They were all real. You know, I use real people, real newspapers, real. Then he was like, oh my God. I said, yeah, I know. It's We have a different ear for Victorian language than actually was Victorian language. So that made me laugh. That is funny. Um, so I was Death... proud of those books as well, and they sank. But I was really proud of those. Well, it's funny that Deaf House is considered a YA now. I didn't really, I, I didn't think of it that way, and I th- don't think the American well, version was I think marketed that way. They they said Gallant said it was crossover, and I think that was their way of being able to publish me without causing too much of a ruckus with Quercus. You know, because mm. Quirks had bought these two adult novels. But I kind of figure it works for both. I think there's a lot of themes that for adults that will will take a different read on it. But I think teens can still read it as a, you know, as a story in it in and of itself for them. Whereas I think when you're an adult, you read it differently as a, you know, allegory for making the most of it all. Right. Well, and I'll take some uh credit for this what death house became a staff pick in mysterious galaxies for a long time because i you. well not i didn't work there but i did you get it stuck through the i door? convinced the person who had it as a snack a staff pick to read it uh when i bought my copy at mysterious galaxies and i definitely owe you royalties or at least dinner next time i'm in america <laughs> i'm well you know here's the thing I if I love an author I'm going to promote the hell out of them because like I that's it's what I it's I believe the bookosphere has you know is it as a living object that gets fed by the people who read things and so I find it very important but Death House I hadn't even read it yet I I just went on this tear about this is why Sarah Pember is so great and why you got to read them when I bought my copy of death house at mysterious galaxies and then i saw a couple weeks later that it was a staff pick the same cashier who or the same person who sold it to me and i was like all right i hadn't read it yet i bought it that day and i hadn't read it yet because it's just whatever i had on my plate and so i went and read it. one of the things i think is really impressive about death house and really shows some of your strengths as a writer and how um you you work with the story and what you need to do in the story is the thing that makes dog face guys especially a matter of blood so great is the world building the world building in it is really fantastic and i say this to somebody who is obsessed with the entire canon of science fiction and and t- teaches and researches the history of science fiction canon so world building is a thing i know and i'm very you know nitpicky about and I think the world building in Dark Face Gods is great, but one of the things I love about Death House, it's almost devoid of world building. Very specifically. Yeah. Right? And I don't know if you knew that's where I was going, but what one of the things I love about Death House is one of the things that makes it creepy is there is absolutely nothing beyond the walls of that story 
to hold on it's people either love or hate that i did it i did that we have a thing over here i don't know if they have it in america called the women's institute it's like it's often older women and you know we call it the wi Mm-hmm. And there's a local branch here, and they asked me to go in and do a talk the other night. And we did a Q and A, and this older woman said to me, she "said Yes, the Death House." She said, "Well, she goes, I read that whole book when I wanted to stop, and I read the whole way to find out what was going on and what the world was, and you never told us." And I was like, oh, "Okay," <laughs> I said, "Well, that's not the point of the book, but you know, hey ho." But well, yeah, some I think... people like it. I kind of I tried to treat it with the approach of we're in a character's head a teenage boy so it's quite a self-absorbed head he's not going to be analyzing the world around him he's literally living in the moment with these kids in this house and he knows the world he's not going to be talking about the world so you know I just kind of went with that flow and tried to make it about that moment in those children's lives really well I find isolation terrifying it's one of the reasons why the thing works for me for yeah same here and and I think one of the things about death house is is that the it the isolation of and the loneliness of the fact that you don't know anything about this world and for me like yes in the fir- initial pages i think i said in my review for the first 100 pages i wasn't completely sold on it and i was like not sure because i was reaching for those things and then there became a point when i was reading it where i was like okay i see what sarah's doing here <laughs> i see why i'm not supposed to know these things i'm not supposed to know these things because he doesn't know these things and that adds to the fear and the isolation of it. And uh, it ended up being one of, one of my favorites of, of, of your work. Um, and for that reason, I'm not going to go big into Death House because I want to talk about the more recent books. But it seems like 13 Minutes, even though it was written to be YA, is very transitional towards the type of work that you're doing now. Oh, because- yeah. I call it my first psychological thriller. Yeah. Definitely. You know, because there's no, I mean, in some ways more so than behind her eyes and insomnia because there's no weird in it you know it literally is a great thriller about these teenage girls and you know and who tried to kill her so it was it was a great um I mean over here they brought out the hardback and it tanked and then they brought out the paperback and someone in Galantz did a whole new front cover and it made it very much a teenage book and it's still you know, every time I go into Waterstones, there's still a stack of them. Teenagers. It's actually read by actual teenagers. You know, often why right. it is read by adults. But I think it's now the paperback sold like 110,000 or something, which for a YA paperback with no marketing spend. Yeah, I like- have that that edition. I have that British edition um, mm. and uh, uh, my copy of 13 Minutes. And um, I can't remember. Well, Rob at Mysterious Galaxies, he sometimes is really good about curating like the right the right editions oh. and making sure. And like um he'll he'll order like whatever um edition that he thinks is the best cover or whatever. And so he's really good about that. And I say this as Mysterious Galaxies has moved and is actually in bike riding distance to me now. So Oh my gosh. Like um I you know, I'm so lucky to have Mysterious Galaxies as a bookstore. So I'm just going to shout it out again. Um, and the then, American, uh, the American version of 13 minutes, I had to cut 50 pages from the first 200 because they wanted it to be straight YA, whereas the English version had more adult characters. Oh, more, yeah. So that you was know what? Quite I weird. think that is why we got the British edition. I think. You I want to do the director's cut. <laughs> right, right. Now I recall that that was the reason why. Is because I remember, I think, seeing stuff you said online about, about it and being like, well, no, nah, I'm going to get that version. And I think that's why. Yeah, now probably, that I think about it. Probably, yeah. yeah. I yeah. know you're a purist. You're a purist. Because... Well, I want the author's vision, right? You know? Uh, but... Speaking of Mysterious Galaxies, that's where we you did the signing for Behind Her Eyes, and um, you you did and doing an American tour was was a big deal. One of the things that was really interesting for me as a longtime fan of your work already was the fact that they were selling Behind Her Eyes in Costco's uh, g- grocery stores, which um, was was mind blowing. I remember sending Brian Keene a picture of me holding behind her eyes in a Costco and being like, can you fucking believe this? And like, we had a real good laugh about how awesome it was that, you know, one of us was being, any of us was being sold. And by any of us, I mean the horror community that 
that one of us was being sold in a Costco is like mind blowing and a, and a, an awesome sign of the success of Behind Your Eyes, even before the Netflix series. Um, and I I think a lot of you, a lot of listeners will know your work because of that series. And so I think the secret's out, but we're going to keep the spoiler. I'm going to do a spoiler warning where we talk about insomnia and, and, and stuff here in a little bit. But you had to calculate the ending of that book through the entire writing of it, right? Well, I, mean, I started with the end. Yeah. So I had, I wrote that last chapter was in the pitch. Right. So I knew where it was going. Like some writers, you know, don't plan. I, I, I don't plan overly, but I have to have the ending and I have to have like, and the more screenwriting I do, the more I structure my novels before I start, you know, like, but I've always had to have the ending. I have to see. I'm an outliner, of- so I have no problem. Thank with that. you. I think people who don't outline are psychopaths, but that's just my. That's just, I, I don't understand how crime novelists can write a crime novel without an outline. I'm like, how? So I had that ending. But yeah, I remember my editor at the time saying, this is going to be a really hard book to write. And I was like, oh, not really. It's quite straightforward. I've got a plan. And then I realized that to be honest throughout and still be so deceptive was you really had, hard. <laughs> yeah, you had to think about the characters motivation i hate that i don't i would never lie you know like i people would, could go back and read that book and no one lies in it and right. the truth is all there it's just you know like i just had to disguise it well but yeah well but it was and, such a right. and i remember and i had commented to you specifically on twitter when they first started making the wtf wtf that ending hashtag um, and let me tell you my personal story with reading behind her eyes because of because I remember saying at the time before I read it, wow, that is bold as hell, like promoting a book that way. Now you got to live up to it. And and I admit I was skeptical that the ending was going to hit that hard. And when I read behind her eyes, I read the last maybe 60 pages on my morning commute to work. I was at the time taking the bus every day and I was reading behind her eyes on the bus and I got to the last like maybe 10 pages when I got to work 10 minutes early and I was like, okay, good, I can finish this. But I remember having a thought when I was like maybe six pages out, you know, this ending's not that crazy. I don't know what she was talking about. I think that was a really weird way to, and then. <laughs> then you turned the page and went, oh. <laughs> exactly. And then I was like, and I remember the starting of promoting this book to my coworkers was one of my coworkers saying to me, David, what's that look on your face? And I was like, holy shit, she did it. <laughs> she did it. And uh, so that was my experience with, and then I had to like go to work. I had start before the work day started and you can't tell anyone because you can't ruin it for anybody. So you're sitting there by yourself with nobody to talk to. And the only person I knew that had finished it already of my friends was my buddy, even in, in Portland. And I had to send him a message later in the day. I have to talk to you. I have to talk to you about the end of this fucking book. <laughs> And we ended up talking that day because I couldn't wait. So I just wanted to put that out there. That's my story. I always have people say like, oh, I got the first twist. And I'm like, that wasn't a twist. That was where I led you. The last bit is the twist. This is the twist, (laughs) right. Well, we'll we'll, um, maybe talk about that. When it came out on the TV, though, that was just the best. Like watching the Twitter hashtag. Yeah, was just it just we were we were in lockdown and so there'd been no big party there'd been no premiere there'd been nothing I was at my mom's with a KFC you know but watching the Twitter scrolling of the gifts and people reacting to the ending it was just like it yeah was, it was so uh, surreal and and for all the readers too who had already read it yeah that know. authors were uh, readers were coming on going yeah yeah I knew you guys were gonna freak out it was like an ownership of it and I was like yeah my team that were read it first you know? <laughs> <laughs> right and I then had the second experience but what was really cool to me too I had the experience because I had 
convinced so many of my coworkers, probably probably six coworkers to and some of them don't work with me anymore but I'm still in touch with them or whatever mm. and so I had all these coworkers that I had convinced to read behind her eyes and I'd say oh a Netflix series is coming and so we all kind of shared together like promoting the series of knowing you know especially at work those who still work there and we would be like oh just you wait yeah <laughs> you know you should really should read the book first you're you know and and whatever but it was hilarious too because we all kind of shared the thing when the series was coming out of watching all their faces and and uh specifically i have a coworker, Lindsay, who she would come in and say have you have you seen the reaction on twitter to behind her eyes and i'm like yeah great and she's like crazy but she said to me and she's like I'll always remember, David, you said this book was going to be huge. And now I listen to you. And it was specifically behind her eyes is the one that now she listens to my book recommendations. Ah. So, yeah. And uh, um, so I owe you that too. But no, you said in an interview recently that you became really interested in telling the stories of women, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And that seems to be the theme of where the books kind of went after Behind Her Eyes. Yeah. Right? I mean, I'm not sure that, I mean, I'm, they may stay that way, but I, you know, I'm like, I like to move around a bit, but you, yeah, yeah, they, they were, I think starting with 13 minutes really, where it was teenage girls. And then I think when I wrote Behind Her Eyes, I was 44, I think. So I was at an age where you start to evaluate more. You're not going to have children probably. And, you know, like I was watching all my friends have children. I was watching their marriages. I was, you know, I was seeing how messy life could be. So I did, I did start to appreciate how much work my friends had to put into their lives in a way that single people don't necessarily, it's different pressures, different, yeah, you know, different kind of vibes. So, yeah, I think as I've got older, I'm definitely much more into sort of exploring the female experience. But to to be fair, also now that I've done, so my next one that I'm writing now, there is a male viewpoint in it. It's a husband and wife viewpoint, you know. I mean, obviously it's bonkers, but there's, you know, it's it's, it's got a male viewpoint, which is quite fun. Um, And then I think after this, I might have a little change in direction and go back a bit more kind of, um, multi-narrative you know like more dog face godsy maybe i don't know that kind oh, of thing. well i'm excited for that but i do want to say and i i've been on record with this especially in my review to dead to her and i'm just going to read what i wrote because i think i not i think i'll say it better i said it better then than i would say it now if i just okay. said it off the top of my head but i said the last couple of pinborough novels are about the day-to-day death of a thousand cuts of daily patriarchy in every way that Margaret Atwood deals with the system. Dead to her is a book about the other younger woman. Now in the same way, insomnia is about is a monster novel where the monster is the 40th birthday. Right. (laughs) And um, so what I appreciate about what you're doing is there's not a, kind of raised fist like octavia butler ursula Le guin like in I your need face day ordinary woman dealing with shit you know like right that's kind of... but i think that the way you're confronting patriarchy is really just as important and in a lot of ways um there's and i said this especially about dead to her there's I did love your review of Dead to Her. I thought you really got it because it's fun and it's sexy, but it's actually got trying to say something about. Right. You know. Well, and I, in my review of Dead to Her, I really just, I, I felt like this book is speaking to men in a way that they're never going to want to hear. <laughs> right. That, that saying really uncomfortable things about, and in a really goofy way, because the men kind of drop out of the book right and they go to the background in a way that i think there was just recently this article in psychology today about how there's this rise of single men and it, and and the the key insights for the article it said 
men are having trouble dating because of the I saw of that because because yeah. um good relationship values have taken over or something wasn't it and you're like oh good so they can't be weird now it just has to be you're right you know, and you know i was talking to somebody about that article in my work and they said doesn't that bother you and i said no i've been married for 20 years i don't care it doesn't matter to me it's not about me i <laughs> you know i uh but dead to her like one of the things i really loved about that book is it starts off with a misdirection and and look you and I are both big F. Paul Wilson fans. And one of the things that F. Paul Wilson does really well is misdirecting on books. Like he gets you thinking his books about one thing and it's about another. And Dead to Her was, was uh, I remember telling somebody that the book was very F. Paul Wilson, but not in an obvious way. It doesn't, yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't have a story like an F. Paul Wilson novel, but it misdirects like an F. Paul Wilson novel. And where it looks like it's all going to be this showdown over this man. And then the man doesn't fucking matter like, at all. Yeah. yeah, he doesn't fucking matter at but all. But I think all. that's so true of female politics. It's never really about the man. It's always about the other woman. Yeah. You know, we're always more worried about what women think about us than we are what men think about us. You know, that's that's our you know inbred from conditioning for hundreds of years we kind of are so wary of other women whereas actually we'd all do a lot better if we just trusted each other <laughs> and, and one of the it. cool things for me too as a sarah pimborough reader is because i trust you and i'm going to read everything that you do i don't i never look at the i never look at the plot beforehand i never oh, read really? the dust jacket i never read oh, and so i always God. go in completely cold because you're one of those authors that i trust to do Thank that with you. Um, quite, a, quite a responsibility <laughs> well and i think it really paid off in insomnia um your most recent novel is that i i knew nothing about it and i feel i don't think it's ever going to be marketed this way or it's ever going to be promoted this way but i think of insomnia as a horror novel i think it's a horror novel and i'm a believer in the idea that we should be expanding the scope of what is horror and what is not horror. I, it definitely just, has horror elements. It's definitely a lot creepier than Dead to Her or Behind Her Eyes. Right. You know, definitely it, creepier. And that's not to say that I don't want to scare away people who don't read horror, but that's not my listeners. So, um, so I, I, but I really do feel that, you know, and it's not like it, it's an actual monster novel. It's not, but it it has a lot of the feeling of a monster novel because the fortieth birthday, and that's one of those subtle fe feminist themes. Is that I think it has two the two female themes for me in it are mm -hmm. your fortieth birthday, getting older, and turning into your mother. Right, the things right. that terrify women the most: getting old and what we've been and turning into your mother. These are the things we're told are the worst things that can possibly happen to us. So she has both of those fears. Exactly. And I didn't like know that was the thing that you were writing about when you went into it, but I wrote about it in my review. And because I think you you pulled it off. And that's one of the things that where, again, it's not like, you know, like Riot Girl stuff, but I think it's super great, like um, real daily uh, feminism. It's it's a it's feminist themes in 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 the, these books and it's one of the things that i love about it so um is there anything else before we get into spoilers that you want to say about insomnia for anyone just because it's the most recent one and i know we've talked a lot and we didn't get to insomnia but i do really feel um it's an incredible it's an incredible novel it's very character driven and um i think it's for me it really um well, I'll get into it in spoilers, but is there anything else you want to say about Insomnia before we move I on? I would say that it's quite a good sister novel to Behind Her Eyes. I think it sits in that space. You know, it's it, mm. we've got sleeplessness, it's nighttime, it's unreliability. Um, and it definitely was kind of, I drew on during the pandemic, I noticed that it was women that were carrying everything. <laughs> you know, when I would look at yeah. my friends, they're locked down, they're still doing their own jobs. They're doing the homeschooling, most of it. 
you know, that they're, they're doing the worrying about the pandemic because most men that I know had their head in the sand a little bit. You know, they were like, it's going to go away. And the women were like, wash your hands. You know, like it was right. you know, worrying about everything and trying to hold everything together. And and women just stopped sleeping. And I noticed that women in their 40s are really just don't sleep. You know, we just don't sleep. Everything is a worry. And and we go through this whole bodily change that men, you know, we have we literally reset our entire system. So we have to go through that as well at a time where people are kids are growing up and, you know, you're trying to sort your careers and stay, help keep hold of your marriage. So I kind of wanted to play with that. So I made her a career woman with a stay at home husband. So I wanted to flip those kind well, of gender roles. And I got the OK to talk about this before. <laughs> from your wife. <laughs> from my wife. But I understood what was going on in insomnia a lot better because I'm living with someone going through menopause. Right. Yeah. Like as I read it. And, um, so I, I get it because like, you know, if you're waking up in the middle of the night and you're burning on fire, yeah. like, it's hard to get back to sleep. And, and your brain is racing and everything is like, your brain's trying to change its chemistry and you're thinking all the worst thoughts in the world and ugh, it's horrible. Yeah. And I know that if I read this book 15 years ago, I probably wouldn't have gotten that. And if I wasn't having that experience inside my home, you know, I probably, I definitely wouldn't have understood. I would have been like, what, what is, you know, it just wouldn't have occurred to me. So yeah. I think you're speaking to, you know, a, a time and a feeling and a thing that that's, that I think will be very meaningful to women. I think readers. women seem yeah. to really be, I, I mean, I don't normally write likable characters very much. You know, I, maybe I'm not, not very likable, but I, I find unlikable characters more interesting. But right. people have really got on board with Emma and people are saying I really, you know, like got her problems. So I yeah, think I want to talk about her there. as a character and spoilers here in just a little mm -hmm. bit. So, all right. Okay, folks, spoiler uh, away. Go yeah, ahead. The yeah, the spoiler warning has been given. Um, obviously behind her eyes was, was outlined, but you had to literally, and you kind of mentioned this earlier and that it's a hard book to write, but now we're in spoilers. So we can go into more details on this. You had to think about the ending on every single page of that book, every interaction. And I, I had to, yeah, that's every a very itself. unique situation. Mm. I think maybe like, I don't think even the dead zone King would have had to have necessarily was, you know there about. was really weird but it was writing Adele was so hard you know because I had to be true to Rob while writing Adele and then like and there was one bit when she was in the basement and she's looking through photo albums and she says I'm looking at a stranger's face and I was like oh I'm so good because she literally was looking yeah. at a stranger's face because it wasn't Rob and it wasn't you know so yeah I mean I think it was harder than I thought it would be um yeah. By the but, way, I love that moment. Oh, I'm so good. Because I, you know, every writer, <laughs> like when you really feel you have like, those oh, little moments and you're like, oh God, that was good. But what I get handed it. A lot of it, times you know no one's gonna notice it. But yeah, <laughs> exactly. But my editor at the time said to me, Sarah, you've got to make these clues stronger. And I was like, really? She said, yeah, because like to you, they've got a big red flag over them saying, here's a clue, but to the ordinary reader. But when I did my tour where I first met you and um, I went to, I can't remember where, what city I was in, but this lovely book group came. There was about six or seven women and they'd all read it and they were at the back of the room. And I said, like, I don't mind when people say they don't like the book, but it annoys me when they say, I just threw the ending on because like, it's all through the book. So when I got to the reading part, I started to read at the beginning and these women just went, oh, like they suddenly could because they knew how it ended they were like oh my god yes of course there's the you know they could see it so that was quite satisfying but yeah it was quite tricky it was tricky mm -hmm. I mean I can't remember really it was so so long ago now that it's like six years ago so it's I think it's probably like childbirth not that I've done that but you know like the pain of it is gone now right <laughs> Well, and the money just, helped with the pain, David. The money helped with the pain. <laughs> well, I, I'm sure, yes. Well, and, and the 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 thing about the success of it too is is that you had to know that this one is one that people just randomly two years later somebody's going to read it and they're having the experience. So then it starts the whole cycle again with mm. one reader. You know, there's a saying that. Um, we had an activism one plus one is how it's done 
and and like i think behind her eyes was definitely a book that was one plus one just all the time of just yeah you know one reader gets it and then says oh no you, 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 you gotta read this you gotta read this yeah. yeah and i think the tv was similar you yeah. know i think the tv was similar people were like i mean it was just I'd, you don't get that instant reaction with books you know and there was just facebook posts were like going mental over it like a friend of mine was in dubai and she went our whole british expat facebook page is just behind her eyes behind her eyes behind her eyes behind her eyes so yeah mm. cool oh no everybody in my work here in san diego for a couple of days and it was really fun for those of us who had read the book because you know the non-readers were discovering and you know and then they're you know there was a day or two after that uh, or, or after the show started kind of like where a few people were like, ooh, maybe I should be asking David for book recommendations. <laughs> you know? Just like, yes, you know, yes, that's you what did. I do. But um, <laughs> well, and it was hilarious, too, because we have like one thing we have in our neighborhood here in San Diego, here in Ocean Beach is there's like free libraries. Mm. and we're just like people put little they build a little shack we've got some they came up in my town during the lockdown people put little shacks outside their house and you just yeah. go and swap books and stuff yeah and it was hilarious too because um i did have a co-worker come in one day that she got across her heart in one of the free libraries and she came in like yes <laughs> <laughs> and i was like and it was right after you know behind her eyes the tv series so it was kind of a funny thing so now in, on Insomnia, in so the 40th birthday kind of lo is lurking in the shadows like a monster, but it's off screen like the shark and Jaws, right? Mm -hmm. And it's coming and it's coming. And I, it, did you think in terms of it being a monster or did you use some of those tricks we know as horror writers to build up the suspense towards uh, think, the coming birthday? That Yeah, way? I just wanted to make it a ticking clock. You know, I just wanted to say it's 12 days, 11 days, 10 days. So we're built coming down. You know, at first it was going to be 28 days. And I thought I can't sustain 28 days of suspense. And she would be dead because, you know, it transpires. You can only go about 11 days without sleep before you die. So, you know, that was, but it, it, it was amazing how quickly people can unravel with no sleep, two or three days and you're hallucinating. So I really wanted, the monster really is, is our own fear and her own fear and this idea of children mis misinterpreting the past, you know, like this idea mm. of, of what you think happened is not necessarily the truth of what happened. And well, you know, and when her daughter starts questioning her, and even though you, we have the situation where she finds out that the daughter is involved with the neighbor, yeah, and you know, it's it's I I, I really felt that because. It's one of those moments, it's like a lot of times when you watch a TV show or read a book and a character is not saying something that you're just dying for them to say yeah. and to scream. And and what, you know, with her, like, you, you just want to be like, with the daughter, like, oh my God, you idiot. What are you doing involved with this older man? You I know. know. Like, and we've what? all been stupid, you know, and you kind of are like, oh God, she's just being a 17 year old, but it's like, stop it. Right. And so Emma's pain at not, she doesn't want to alienate her daughter, but she doesn't want to not say something. Well, she's in such a mess by that point yeah. that, you know, it's a bit like, you know, she doesn't do the right thing, really. She thinks she's got it under control, but of course it comes back and bites her. But I think for me, the main thing was more in in these kind of psychological thrillers so this is to me a supernatural psychological thriller veers a bit on horror it's kind of a ghost story really in a lot yeah. of ways but um there's always an unreliable narrator and which one is it and in this i kind of wanted to take the unreliable narrator to the next level where she doesn't even trust her own narration mm -hmm. she doesn't she's not sure of what she's doing so how can anyone else be sure of her you know she's not sure she's sane so that, you know, it's this kind of, you know, is she turning into a mother? Is she going to have the same fate? Is all the, and, and whether we create our own fate, that kind of thing, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, it was pain in the ass, that book. I was glad when it was finished. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the thing with the mom having still been alive all that time, mm -hmm. but secret. Yeah. And in, in a lot of ways, the mom, and it's really interesting as somebody who briefly worked in elder care. So I've, I've kind of seen that world where... Mm. And it's, 
you know, I had the experience when I worked in that field for a little while where some of these elder seniors, like they're almost living like ghosts. They're almost like yeah, ghosts. They're uh, empty almost. They're yeah. ghosts of themselves. And so I got that whole ghost aspect with the mom. Mm -hmm. Um, and that whole part I thought was really brilliant and just, um, you know, really clever writing. One of the things that I thought was really, and, and this is part of the under the hood thing of the, uh, that I've just been dying to ask you about this book is one of the important decisions you made with Emma is to make her role as a divorce attorney. She's benefited from sexism, right? Yeah. And, and I thought that was such a important decision because as everything goes, the, 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 the strings of her sanity gonna like get pulled apart by patriarchy itself. So yeah. it's look, I say this all the time to me, the, the, and I learned this from Shane black is one of my favorite screenwriters. The keys to storytelling is parallels and reversals. And yeah. one of the things I love about insomnia is the whole fucking thing is parallels and reversals <laughs> throughout. So we yeah. had reversals in the storyline where things, you know, and so what I loved about Emma is she is parallels and reversals as a character. So what she's benefited from sexism. So that's your parallel. And the reversal is all this patriarchy is the things that pull the strings at her sanity throughout the book. Mm. So how early in the process did you think of or think of her as being benefiting from sexism and being the lawyer was that always baked in from the beginning well she i mean in the early days i mulled over a few jobs for her and she was going to be in marketing and she was going to, there was lots of different jobs and then i thought actually this is a family story this is about family so if i was emma and i'd had that awful start in life what would i want i'd want control and i'd want to try and mend things do you know what i mean i'd want to yeah. feel like i had control of family so she she benefits from patriarchy by trying to be it do you know what i mean like she has yeah. to stay at home husband she's in control of everything but to really face her past she has to let all of that go and trust her female instincts you know so it's kind of i didn't really think i don't tend to think in terms of theme as i'm writing maybe more so these days but i do think in terms of character and i think i remember being in my 20s in the 90s and I had some quite high flying jobs. And I remember saying to someone, I think like a man, which was perhaps the most stupid thing ever to say because I was in my twenties. But in that time, that was a good thing. You know, it was like, oh, people will take me seriously if I think like a man, you know, mm -hmm. like it was good to try and be as, it's like this whole thing about Elizabeth I, was she, you know, gender fluid? No, I think she probably was just, she said things about being manly because that got respect. You know, re you know, women have to be, to, you know, in the, you know, had to be a little bit kind of, similar to men in their outlook to get some respect and so I kind of had Emma playing this role um and then has it all stripped away from her and has her her whole view of her life shaken up so it was more I kind of come at it from character rather than theme so I was like well if I was Emma how would I be and this is what I'd want and this is what would freak me out and you know and but you know I kind of hope that at the end of it she's female empowered rather than you know she gets her she gets her own back on it all anyway well it, it just as a fan of parallels and reversals i just I, that's why insomnia just kicked my butt and why i thought it was really good and and one of the cool things about insomnia was is it was a book that um i appreciated more as i started writing about it Right. Like I liked it when I read it and I thought mm. it was great and it was all these things. But um, I discovered a lot about insomnia when I sat down to write my review and kind of pick it apart. Because what I do when I read a book, especially because I know I'm going to re I review everything, is that I and, th and I do that. The only reason why I started reviewing everything is because I learned that I learn more from my experience of reading a book by writing about it. Yeah. So I just decided that that was going to be my way to become a better writer and reader is to just write these detailed reviews. And Insomnia was a great example because I thumb, I dog-eared pages and I was like, okay, this is an important part. I'm going to come back to this. And 
I got so many more of the levels of insomnia that second time going through and looking at it and then looking for the themes, whether they were accidental or not or whatever. I I just, I got a lot out of that. And so insomnia was one that I liked it when I first read it, but insomnia was one that, that, that grew on me a a lot Uh, dead to her as well. A, a little bit because i think a lot of the, the 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 themes about patriarchy and stuff um it came up there more all right so um we're gonna i'm gonna start to wrap things up i forgot one thing pre-spoiler and i may even edit this back and put it back <laughs> spoilers but i gotta know what a big freaking deal it was not only did stephen king blur behind her eyes that had to be huge and death and the death house and the death house but he he made you one of the few people he follows on twitter he loves your dog (laughs) i know know. i'm always like sometimes i think please never unfollow me mr king when he first followed me i literally couldn't tweet for days because i was so nervous he'd made a mistake and then (laughs) if i tweeted he'd be like why am i following her that i'm following the first time he replied to me or retweeted my dog i was like oh yeah yeah he does love my ted i think he only follows me for ted (laughs) (laughs) um well you know i got my wife to watch behind her eyes because of ted Ah. because she loves ted and you know i think she was a my wife is very 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 picky about the shows that she likes and things like that and it was funny because i remember at the end i was like it's ted's mom and she's like yeah i want to watch okay i'll let her off she can yeah i will watch this and she of course enjoyed it but um no, and every once in a while, I'll she'll say, "Have you seen any Ted pictures lately?" And I'll be like, "Okay, I'll look." Um, Ted's on, I've had a couple on Twitter this past couple of days because he's not been allowed. We're not allowed to take him out in the afternoon because it's been so hot, and they're not used to it, you know. Right. So, um, like but they're inbound. Back to the Stephen King thing. He's a big fan of your work. That has to. Oh my That's... god! It was like when he read the death house it wasn't even out in america and i went onto twitter and i just kept seeing like new york times sarah pember and stephen king all in the same like replies and things and tweets and i was like why am i being mentioned alongside the new york times and stephen king and i was like i don't know so i looked and he'd been in this new york times article and they've been saying what have you read recently that you've enjoyed and he was like oh i read this book by sarah pember and i was like and it turned out that Bev Vincent gave it to him. Because I was like, ah. how did he even get this book? It's not out in America. Bev Vincent, Bev... who was recently on, on this podcast. So. Ah, yes. Yeah, so he, so I'm very grateful to him. He said to him, you read this book, you'll like it. So, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm jealous of Bev because as somebody who's writing a book about Philip K. Dick and as, as, and is currently do, five years into a Philip K. Dick podcast, my guy's not alive anymore. So. <laughs> <laughs> I always tell Bev, like, I'm so jealous. Like, he gets to trade emails with that. Like, yeah. I'm writing about a guy who's been gone since yeah, I because I wrote the intro for the um, PS Cuj- publishing. For Cujo, edition. right? Cujo. And so then he emailed me and was like, thanking me for it. And, but I've been very good. I don't use that email. <laughs> like, I'm, like, I'm never going to email him, but I have his email. Right, right. Well, you know, that's uh, I think um, that like I don't have any kind of there's him and maybe Madonna, for, but she's kind of gone off the wheels a bit. But from my childhood years, you know, when you have your icons, right. like Stephen King and Madonna, they're my icons. Well, you know, I always tell people that I grew up in punk rock, and so like the bands and the people are all like there's no dividing line. The only time I've ever been so starstruck I couldn't speak, Clive Barker, a little bit, yeah. Um, cause we got seated at the Stoker Awards one year, all the vegetarians, they put us together. So we got seated with Clive. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And so like, I kind of got over it after spending a whole night, Yeah. you know, whatever. And then, but read, meeting Richard Matheson was the only time that your I, moment. I just, I had marbles in my mouth. I couldn't, I just like, I had that with John Connolly when it, we were at world fantasy San Diego, actually. Mm-hmm. and um i had never met him this is maybe just as a matter of blood had come out so a long time ago and uh maria regan and paul came were like oh we're gonna go and say hello to john Connolly. come and say hello and i was like i can't i can't he's my like i my hero i love all his books 
and now we're like best mates and we you know banter all the time on panels everywhere so it's you know turned out fine yeah well my i got a great story out of richard matheson part partially because he was having a hilarious time seeing how much i was fumbling over my words and like, but he was like it's okay calm down and he told i had asked him about the dog scene in i am legend and he told me that he had and i had never known this before but he said that he wrote it for a class at ucla a novel writing class okay 1954 and i was like you wrote i am legend for a class and the teacher made him read the dog chapter to the whole class oh my and, god and he said that 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 the end the teacher said um folks this is a writer and i thought that was amazing and i got to um share that story with one of his sons um when we uh when we met and he was like, I've never heard that story. And I was like, ah, oh, cool. <laughs> story. Yeah. But okay, Sarah, I really appreciate the time. I know it's later there in England. Um, and uh, my dog is about to start barking for my attention. And I'm, I don't know if that's going to happen on your end. But um, there he goes. There he goes. <laughs> He's the one that kind of looks like Teddy. I think they're cousins. But, uh, but yeah, I... Um, I uh, really appreciate the time. Uh, always a fan of your work. You know, I'll read w whatever you've got going. Um, Thank you. And I think you said that you just worked on uh, adapting Insomnia for for. Yeah, TV. Is we're that what's the next thing. Yeah, we're pretty much we're pretty much greenlit. So until the announcement comes, obviously I can't say anything. But um, yeah, so I've got a busy <sighs> few months ahead. And then obviously another book and your dog saying, come on. Come hey. on now. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, um, I appreciate all uh, your time. Uh, it's, it's and thank you for all your support. And thank you for all your book pimping. Well, you know, um, I wouldn't do it if the books weren't great. So I appreciate thank that. You. Sarah, thank you for joining Postcards from a Dying World. Um, everyone, um, I believe we're going back to back with Alma Katsu. So we have two great women horror writers. I love her. I love her work. Love it. Love it. Love it. Yeah. And uh, so she's right before you. So uh, it's a great uh, double. And we had two Brits uh, with uh, Tim Levin too recently. So love it. Um, Sarah, thank you for coming on. And I'm sure we'll try to have you back on another time. Thank you.